Hey folks, this is Riker, with a video about how Diablo almost imploded before release, more than once. In this video, we'll discuss some of the highlights of a recent Diablo retrospect panel at the Portland Gaming Expo, in which three former Diablo devs, Jay Wilson, Matt Ullman, and Matt Householder, also shared how Diablo 2's skill tree was actually stolen from StarCraft, the true reason Blizzard North was shut down, details about Blizzard's insane grind culture, and more. Discussion timestamps can be found in the description below if you want to skip ahead to different topics. But right before you do, just a quick reminder to ring that sub notification bell to be alerted to new videos. Now before we move on, just a quick word for this video's sponsor, Bloodline Heroes of Lithus, a strategic hero collector RPG where you can not only collect champions and build kingdoms, but also create half-blood heirs of your houses by merging the powers of various bloodlines such as orcs, elves, lichens, and demons. Bloodlines Heroes of Lithus is a mobile game with simple controls and realistic fantasy graphics in a vertical screen with a unique twist on gacha gameplay something they call the hybrid system. Basically, you collect champions while you're building up your kingdom and its economy, and then you can marry your champions to create offspring to create heirs for your kingdom and watch the storyline unfold. And so you want to marry champions to create more powerful offspring, and champions come from different bloodlines, and you can mix different bloodlines to empower your house in different ways. There's over 800 different hybrids, and new bloodlines are released every month, creating even more possibilities. Oh, and you can freely swap the gender of your companions. Waifu, Husbandu, whatever you want. The higher your companion's intimacy, the more powerful your offspring. Coming to the game in the last season of 2022 are two brand new lineages, the Minotaur and the Fox-like Vulpin clan, which are the strongest tanks and most agile assassins. And by participating in the Thanksgiving event starting on November 24th, you can get a Minotaur champion for free. Bloodline Heroes of Lithus is available for free on both Android and iOS. So download and try out the game for free with my link in the description or scan the QR code you see on screen. And use my code in the description to get a special starter pack worth $20 that includes three stamina potions, 100,000 gold, and 100 diamonds. Now, as we dive in, you may recognize the panelists here, who are all former Blizzard employees. We have Matt Ullman, who turns out to be a surprisingly funny guy. He's a known name to Diablo fans, or if you don't recognize the name, you do recognize the music. You have him to thank for the iconic music and sound of Diablo 1 and 2. He also worked on Diablo 3's music, and he left Blizzard in 2006, after the launch of World of Warcraft's first expansion, The Burning Crusade, whose soundtrack he helped with. Then there's Jay Wilson, game director of Diablo 3. This is another known name, he was the face of Diablo 3 in all the interviews leading up to release. And he left the Diablo team in 2013, about a year after D3's release, and then he left Blizzard altogether in 2016. But Matt Householder is a name you may not recognize, it's a name I didn't recognize, but I learned that he played a pivotal role in the history of Diablo. He was a producer on Diablo 2 and he contributed to the game in a number of different ways, including writing a lot or almost all of Diablo 2's dialogue. I think he wrote all of Deckard Kane's dialogue, for instance. And he hired on new staff to grow the Blizzard North team from 12 to 65 employees. But on top of that, it turns out that without him, Diablo as we know it may have never existed. You see, Householder was already a veteran of the video game industry back in 1993, when David Brevik, Max Schaefer, and Eric Schaefer decided to found Condor Games. At the time, Householder was working for DTMC Games, which is a Hong Kong publisher for Nintendo and Genesis games. Condor, meanwhile, was looking for a publisher for the game they wanted to make, Diablo. Max Schaefer ended up speaking with Householder. Max pitched Diablo to Matt, probably with this very design document right here. And that's when Matt Householder possibly save Diablo from getting lost in development hell. Rather than taking on the project at DTMC, he warned Max that DTMC was going out of business and encouraged him to look for a different publisher. I knew it was going to be a hit when I first saw it. In fact, Max pitched me the game when I was at DTMC and I said, Max, DTMC is going out of business. Pitch this game to somebody else. We're, don't, don't get tangled up with us because it might get taken down. So anyway. Had Matt just taken on the project, and then DTMC would have gone out of business, who knows what would have happened to Diablo. But that wasn't the only favor that Matt would do for the Diablo team, before even joining them. You see, in 1994, when Householder was now working at 3DO, 
a certain Matt Ullman would contact Matt Householder. He was looking for work. Householder spoke to him a lot, saw a lot of promise in Ullman, so he referred him to Max Schaefer and encouraged him to try to get a job with Condor on Diablo. Again, had Householder not connected Ullman with Condor, then Diablo would not have had the iconic soundtrack that we know and love today. And that wasn't the only thing that Householder did for Diablo while at 3DO. He got Condor a lucrative contract for a football game prototype that never ended up releasing to the public, but it proved instrumental in helping fund Diablo. Condor's small team of about a dozen employees dedicated two people to working on the football project, and that project by itself paid more than the contract they had gotten for Diablo from their publisher Davidson & Associates. Ullman feels Diablo would have fallen apart without the extra money that Householder's 3DO contract brought in. Meanwhile, I was at 3DO and kicked him a project called uh, M2 Football for the 3DO M2 hardware. Which paid the bills in terms of the team yeah. being able to exist help, and being able to pay make Diablo. Mm -hmm. It probably would have imploded without... Uh, and actually, the contract for a football demo that only had a few people working on it I believe was significantly bigger than the was. contract that, that Davidson novel. got out of us for our original spec work on Diablo. I think that's right, although I'd have no direct knowledge. But I know that you know when Max needed to make payroll, a couple times he'd call me up and say, "Hey, Matt, can you kick me down some money?" And I'd rewrite the right. And it was original 3DO concept. contract because 3DO wasn't delivering on our end, and anyway, and they were doing fine work on the M2 football prototype demo project, and that ended up... Uh, Never seen by the world. Yeah, it ended up, right. you know, sealing the deal for a $100 million There uh, could have been an NBA license. Jams in the 90s that was basically the NBA Jams formula, but with NFL players, and that's what we were developing. But like many things in the history of the entertainment industry, it never existed. Uh, but that's what paid the bills for the original Diablo. So it's paid some of the bills. Yeah. Then it was in 1996 that Householder finally left 3DO and joined Condor, which by this point was known as Blizzard North. And this was just two weeks before Diablo was ready for release. People on the production side of the industry tend to not get a lot of spotlight. They don't get to be the rock stars that the fans get to see. So it was really nice to learn about how important Householder was to the Diablo franchise. Another little tidbit we learned from the panel was about the origin of the little exclamation mark for Quest NPCs. Apparently, it was Matt Householder who invented the idea and implemented it into Diablo. Now, he doesn't claim that anyone else took the idea from him. He acknowledges that it's possible that other developers independently came up with the same idea to represent a quest by an exclamation mark above an NPC, but Jay Wilson and Matt Ullman both seem convinced that, at least for World of Warcraft, the idea was indeed borrowed from the Diablo team. And that's because within Blizzard, all teams borrow from each other significantly. According to Jay Wilson, Diablo 2's skill tree was based off of StarCraft's tech tree. That's something that never occurred to me as someone who played a ton of StarCraft and then a ton of Diablo 2. I would use these tech trees, these printouts, as a reference all the time. But now that I hear it, it's so obvious. It makes perfect sense. I mean, just look. Look at the structure. It's the same. Wilson went on to say that StarCraft 2 and Diablo 3 both stole from each other like mad while both were being developed. I think we'd have to dig a little deeper there to find the similarities, but I think the concept of this mutual borrowing, this culture of stealing ideas from, from other teams at Blizzard is most obvious to people who play both Diablo 3 and World of Warcraft. Both games clearly borrowed so many ideas from each other over time. People keep saying that Diablo became more like WoW and WoW became more like Diablo. Now, another thing we learned from this panel was that Blizzard was built upon a pretty grueling work culture under President Mike Morheim. When Jay Wilson applied at Blizzard, well, first off, he didn't even expect to get the job, despite having a lot of game credits. He just seems like a pretty humble guy. But he said he almost didn't get hired at Blizzard because Mike Morheim was concerned that he would not work enough overtime. I almost didn't get my job at Blizzard because Mike was concerned that I would not work enough overtime. Because I, when they interviewed me, I talked a lot about like the project I'd done right before, shipped right before then. Um, we'd done almost no overtime 
and I considered that to be because of good management. Yeah, something to be proud right, of. Right, it's, right. And something to be proud of. And he looked at it as like, like, oh, so you don't like to work hard. I'm like, um, no. I mean, honestly, no. I mean, who does? Now, all of this wasn't painted in a negative light. These guys weren't ragging on Blizzard or Morheim. They're not saying they're bad because of the grind culture, but there certainly was the connotation of it being unhealthy. But you know, there is a, there is definitely in terms of like the, uh, the the kind of salary man intensity and like the you know what you think you want to have a life <laughs> you know out, outside the job. Now, despite this, Ullman suggested that he's observed a correlation between artists who have an obsessive fixation with their craft and the heights they reach as an artist. In other words, that the toxic grinding work environment at Blizzard likely contributed to what made Blizzard's early games so great. Also, Ullman related how he would see the QA night shift coming in at 6 p.m. So Blizzard would have two big QA staffs to be able to work pretty much around the clock. And that's something he believed contributed to the success of World of Warcraft, that Blizzard games came with a certain amount of reliability because they had QA people constantly looking for bugs. So the grind culture was not just on an individual level, but a company-wide level as well. Blizzard, the entity, always has people working around the clock kind of thing. Now, we also got some clarifying details during the panel on the closure of Blizzard North in 2005. Matt Ullman disputes the narrative put forth on Wikipedia, which is that Vivendi, Blizzard's then-parent company, was responsible. He points out that World of Warcraft had just been a critical and commercial success. It released in 2004. Blizzard was going through a huge growth phase and that Mike Morheim thus had all the bargaining power and all the leverage. I mean, realistically, why would Vivendi be telling Blizzard to shut down any of its branches when Blizzard is doing gangbusters just so well, printing money. So I believe the quote from the Wikipedia article that he's contesting says, a key reason for the closure was Blizzard North's poor development of what was to be Diablo 3, which did not meet Vivendi's expectations. Vivendi is a media holding company. What do they really know about video games? So I believe Ullman here is insinuating that it wasn't Vivendi's expectations that weren't being met but rather Mike Morheim's. Now, it is true, however, that prior to the shutdown of Blizzard North, Vivendi was a big part of the reason why David Brevik, Max Schaefer, Eric Schaefer, and almost 30 employees of Blizzard North quit in 2003. So it could be that maybe people are confusing these two events, and that's why we have this entry in the Wikipedia. But when Blizzard North did shut down, Ullman described how some of the staff were offered to relocate to Blizzard, himself included, and he seemed to disagree with the decision on who to keep. And Mike basically told us all, you know, uh, we're shutting you down. And uh, we're uh, hopefully uh, getting rid of the quarter of you we don't want. And inviting, like, the half we do really want down with the, some money we're dangling in front of you. That was Blizzard North. Again. Yeah, yeah, that, and that was the day that, that yeah. was the day Blizzard North, uh, that was the day uh, yeah. Blizzard North. And you know, the whole, the whole logic in terms of who they did and didn't want, I thought was really kind of short-sighted and dumb in terms of some aspects. I think it made this guy's job a little harder in terms of, I don't know, in some ways, in terms of like, yeah. if that corporate culture was a little bit more delicately handled, uh, insane prima donnas that we were, um, it might have made the foundational part of Diablo 3 a little bit easier. When Jay Wilson was hired in 2006 to take over development of Diablo 3 from the ashes of Blizzard North, Ullman suggested that Wilson's job would have been much easier if certain people had not been let go. And Wilson agreed with this. Now, running the math, if Blizzard North had reached 65 employees, then 30 quit, we're down to 35, then Blizzard North is shut down with roughly half of Blizzard North staff invited to work for Blizzard by Oldman's estimates. So let's say about 17 original members of the Diablo team. Then Jay Wilson said that Diablo 3's final team size was about 70 to 80. So that means less than a quarter of the team consisted of original Blizzard North staff. Now, speaking of Diablo 3, Jay Wilson opened up about some stuff that he felt he couldn't talk about in the past. First off... The auction house. 
Apparently, Jay Wilson did not like it one bit, and he explained why it existed in the first place. The real money auction house. So, the thing that I could never say while I worked at Blizzard was the reason we wanted to do the real money auction house was security. No other reason. Um, it was not to make money, um, because we didn't honestly think it would make that much money. The biggest problem people complained about with Diablo 2 was item duping, and all the hacks, and um, all the gold sellers, and all those things. And when you have, there's almost no way to fix that problem without somehow controlling the trading market. You have to, tr you have to control it in some way. Um, and there's lots of good ways to do it, um, especially now we know even more. But at the time, that was our idea, was, well, if the trading market is in the game, they can't, they, we control it, and the, the hackers don't. Not like DGJSB. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's the other reason why we also went online only. Because when you give out the, when you go, when you don't go online only, you have to give out the client server. And once you give out the client server, hackers got you. But I could not say those things because you do not poke hackers. Like, <laughs> if you say, like, oh, we're doing it for security reasons, then the hackers go, oh, really? Um, it's, so we're, I, I could never say that. Um, we were and, one of the first TGOS attacks, right, back in 97? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the like, first, like, really big ones. Yeah. So, the, and the short answer about the, the uh, profit, it, it made a little bit of money. Nothing compared to, like, I mean, it was not... It was not that profitable. Like, and we never expected it to be. I know people thought we were just trying to make a lot of money. We really thought of it as a courtesy to making the game more secure. Um, I think it, it probably, I want to say it made like, yeah, it, it, if it made more than 10 or 15 million, I'd be surprised. Which is, I sounds like a lot of money, but when you compare like WoW was making like, I don't know, the ridiculous That's every 20 hours yeah yeah well probably made that every 10 seconds like <laughs> it, it was not it was not profitable at all so i mean not at all that's not true it was it was not very profitable. so hopefully this settles once and for all for those who still believe that blizzard did it out of greed jay wilson hasn't worked for blizzard for six years he has no real reason to lie about this if he were a liar he could have easily said yeah activision forced us to do it to absolve himself of any responsibility. And speaking of Activision, it seems the trio could have had quite a bit more to say on that matter, but unfortunately they were short on time. We could do another hour on Bobby Kotick and Blizzard. <laughs> but Jay Wilson did manage to express some of what we all already suspected. So Activision Blizzard was, Activision's effect on Blizzard was like a frog in a boiling pot of water. Like early on, it felt like nothing. Um, but later on, as business models progressed for products, it, it became more and more. The products that, that were newer, the products that were making money, had an enormous amount of pressure on them to produce. Um, the, I know, like Heroes of the Storm, they were just crushed with like meetings with Activision where they're always talking about bottom line. They were always talking about like how to make, how to, how to pull more out of that. D3 didn't get affected by that that much because we were very solidly a, a premium box model. Um, so, but a lot of talk about, you know, Immortal before I, before I left, they, you know, they were talking about Immortal, but it hadn't actually started, was all Activision Blizzard. Like they wanted a free to play Diablo really badly. Um, and I didn't. Um, <laughs> now granted by then I was, I was off Diablo, so. Um, but, um, but yeah, so they had a big effect on, on all those business models and, and everything. And I, in my opinion, a lot of the higher up people who have left did because they just got frustrated with all of that. Um, and I don't think it made um, those products better. We had a saying at Blizzard when I was there. There's a lot of bad things about Blizzard. There's a lot of great things about Blizzard. But I always thought the best thing was they had a saying of like, we always want to be the guys in the white hats which means we always want to be the good guys. So we always want to be doing something that we think is right for our players. So if we charge our players for something, well, of course, we're going to charge them more business. Like, we have to we have to make money. The more money we make, the more we can make more games for our players. But 
we want we always wanted to charge them what we thought was reasonable. So that that was that came in direct conflict. I do hope one day we can get a powwow of all the former Big Blizzard folks who are willing to just completely open up with their thoughts on Activision and Bobby Kotick. Maybe, maybe, once a Microsoft acquisition goes through and Bobby Kotick leaves thereafter, because I can't imagine he'll want to stick around with someone else as his boss, maybe at that point people will feel emboldened to have such a talk. Or maybe it's just a pipe dream. And that's going to wrap up this video. But... Do be sure to have checked out my video on the Diablo 4 release date leak. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. As a reminder, we're doing our annual Patreon banner to get your name on the poster behind me, which you'll be able to buy in the shop. You just have to be a Patreon supporter by December 1st, even at the $1 tier, to get your name on the poster. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.